All right, now our destruction simulation is ready. Let's see how we can bring this into um, the engine. So the first thing I did is to create in the our context um, vertex animation texture node. We can do it in uh, with our uh, Rob network in here too, um, whichever way you prefer. So first thing is to drag this node that uh, I marked as export plus into the input geometry over here. You can even drag it and set the frame range and the mode I need in this case will be RBD. Now let's go through the settings that we have. Um, default default. Um, typically you are you will be using this multi um, RPF you're doing if you're doing destruction simulation. If you're doing some manual rigid body animation, which doesn't have um, angular velocity data, if you're doing like animated rigid pieces and they don't have that, then you change this to uh, the basic short path slope. But most cases, destruction sim, that one. I turned on this one. This one is a slightly expensive and high quality feature. And what it does, it's it smoothly interpolate um, the uh, trajectory of pieces. So between frames, the pieces will not travel in a straight line. It will travel um, in a curved line, taking the acceleration into account. And actually the acceleration will be exported through the color texture as explained here. So you can recompute the acceleration and export them through the RBG, uh, RGB channels of the color texture. That is necessary because in our simulation, uh, we're doing slow motion and our pieces are actually rotating quite a bit. So their trajectories are curvy. When you have a um, type of simulation where the trajectories are not that curvy, they're going in a straight line, then maybe it's not worth turning that on. The other thing I changed here um, is to the export static mesh vertex color. So previously, we've marked the inside faces with a blue color so that we can use that as a masking in the shader. Now there's a new sort of um, display added to the bottom of this node, and this added fairly recently. It will tell you what the amount of um, input geometry uh, currently is exportable. So it depends on two factors. It depends on the target texture width and uh, it depends on the frame range. Of course, the, the more frames of animation you're doing, the the less you can encode because the texture is sort of limited to 8K. So um, the more points you have or the more frames you have, the, the vertical direction um, of the texture, um, you're trying to push in the limit of the vertical direction, it has to stay within 8K in the vertical, vertical direction. But you can reduce that obviously by increase the horizontal direction by like pushing this to the extreme. Um, you can like, use that if you you really have a lot of data to 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 export, as you can see, this the, the this value changed um, by default. It's at um, right here. It's uh, so that's the limit based on your setting, and you can be better informed of how much you can export. Input tab. Um, just want to call attention to this again because this provides all the useful information about what kind of attributes you need to prepare for the specific things you want to do. For the export tab, um, I don't think I really change anything here. Um, for the advanced tab, I turned on this thing, allow exporting real-time data JSON file. So this um, is not it's completely necessary. Um, it is recommended in certain situations one is if you need to do real-time instancing. So if you don't do instancing of this, this geometry or you don't do um, mesh particles, it's also kind of some form of instancing. If you're doing instancing, you have to turn this on, which forces that toggle to be turned on. But in this case, I'm not really doing instancing. I just want to use the, the uh, JSON file data. And the benefit of that is the, the, the pros and cons. The cons of it is slightly inconvenient. So you have to do um, a few more clicks to get them to get the data set ready on the material instance the uh, the pros of that is um, it's more accurate and um, especially it's more accurate when the the bounds of your simulation is huge like the there are pieces that's flying really far away from the center um, 
that just like at the numerical floating point level um, is more accurate and it's also more performant it, it, it requires less instruction count so it's a trade-off um, this thing just get printed every time you click export um, this is for debug information we're not going to go too deeply for that um, we have a post on um, ZFS Labs our station that um, explained how to do debugging um, that's it pretty much you just click render all um, then the asset will be uh, exported so let's once it's exported you can just drag it into the um, Unreal's content browser but one thing I want to call to your attention is how to, to install the plugin so if you go to the real time shaders tab and if you're opening if you're creating a new Unreal project what you need to do is uh, for instance this one uh, you create a plugins folder so once you create a plugins folder then you need to copy your plugin um, into that folder you click on this button it brings you to uh, the plugins we offer so if we're doing the Unreal 5 you would go inside here and copy this and go to the plugin and paste it over here so um, there are two guides here this guide provides you information about um, the, the installation of the plugin uh, to different ways and the detailed information and this is about the FBX and uh, texture settings you can pretty much just like, read it once or twice then um, you'll remember how to do it but I'll show you let's say let's create a temporary photo here Board. I think the name of this is uh, export glass. Okay, it's in here. That's the mesh, textures, and the um, JSON file. So to bring the mesh in, just gonna drop into this temporary folder you can drag the glass in here so I'm gonna just do what the guide is saying turn off everything first um, to leave that on yes, do not create material now, set this to replace vertex color import option, and the only thing you need to turn on is transform vertex to absolute. Change this to import normals and tangent, and that's it. And click import. Now, in Unreal 5, um, there is a slight change so previously in the Unreal 4 version of our tool and the workflow in the build settings you do not need to turn on any of this unless you're doing like really if you're dealing with a very long very tall texture um, or if you have lots of pieces but in this case if you have any issue with the Unreal 5 version of your weather dimension you can turn on the um, UE4 compatible UVs and if this doesn't work, you can turn this off and turn on use full precision UVs. Just don't know for Unreal 5. But that's the input for the mesh for the textures. Um, I'm just going to drag one one of them in as an example. So uh, just just drag glass position. Actually, just just grab two. Why not? 
Now we need to do is like multi select them. Go to script the add to actions. Uh, this will show up once you have the side effects plugin dropped into your plugin folder of your project or your engine. Uh, you can set to HDR. That correlates to this here. You could touch your format here and say to HDR. You need to set it to HDR. If you set it to non HDR here, then you will do the non HDR version. Once you did that, um, select them all and uh, click save. Sometimes this, if the result looks weird, um, it will automatically get fixed after a restart of Unreal. I still don't exactly know um, why that's the case. Just some weird behaviors of um, how Unreal does compression, I don't know, or on it's handling its data. So that's the first easy solution if you see some kind of glitch behavior to your vertex animation is to just restart the editor and that will get the data in the right shape. Um, okay, so next thing we need to import is the data file, the JSON file. So you can drag um, glass over here and uh, in this prompt, choose this version, material parameter, and hit apply. Save that, and we're good not to create a material. Let's put that. That bridge body. So if you hover your mouse over here, you will see there's a tooltip about how many custom UVs channel you need to set and it also tells you to turn off tangent space normal. So let's do that. It says like five for um, normal situations and six if you're doing uh, isms and isms. So here we just need to hook up these guys. And this one with the star is optional. You can read the tooltip basically. The, it's optional because um, they, don't, they don't actually need it, but if you hook it up, it can prevent you from accidentally hook something up, up over here and override it. So it's just sort of like, if you promise you not to not override that channel, then you don't need to hook it up. So normal, just to normal, well position here. And the, cl the, the color here can be, um, since we don't have animated color, you can just set up your it textures or colors however you like over there. That's pretty much how you set up a basic rigid body uh, dynamics. The only thing uh, that's different, I'll jump to the actual project to show you, is that we have set up um, the acceleration for this. I'll show you how to do that. That's tied to the smoothly interpolated trajectory. But for this case, I just want to show you a, a basic setup. Now, Right click on this, create material instance, change it to MI. Uh, I recommend you to turn all of this on. It's guaranteed to have a less chance for bugs. Then you can assign the textures over here. I won't do that right now. Um, just talk, I'm just talking about the uh, how to get the legacy parameters to work. So you turn this on and turn on these guys. Uh, we don't need that. We're not doing instancing. We're just doing uh, the next parameters. Once this is ready, um, this will allow the data table to set it, to turn them on. If they're turned off, it, you can't set it. Save it, close it, go here, click these two, and do set that material instances from data table. Once that's done, you can go over here and can see the fields are populated. And I changed the Houdini FBX to 30 because it depends on what this value is. By default, it's 24. Um, if you want to work in 30 or 60, you can change this accordingly. That's the basic setup. Now let's jump to the actual glass shader that we have here. So in this setup, um, we do have the um, smoothly interpolated trajectory turned on. So in order to use this feature, you have to hook up a little bit of additional stuff in the material. So 
the acceleration data of the pieces are exported through the color RGB. So the color texture, if you look at it, um, I think Ben didn't use it. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I think the result looks okay though. I think just Ben didn't hook it up, but we did have it. Uh, somewhere. Give me one second. Yeah, okay, this is the color texture. So you need to like put the color texture here, then turn on this thing. Then what happens is if you grab the the RGBA color and you feed it into this material function that we provided called transform velocity and put that in here because it's local space acceleration hidden, that's what the data is. Then we need to change it to local space acceleration on real. Once that's done, you can just plug that back in to the local space acceleration, this frame. Uh, once that's set up, the smoothly interpolated tra trajectory can work. And all that thing I just did is also just described in the two tip. Um, yep, that's uh, that's pretty much it for the importing of uh, the vertex animation. The other thing that's interesting to talk about is the crack shading. So there are a lot of cracks, um, but in this version, actually, I wanted to like reduce the amount of cracks you can see because they can get quite noisy. Um, the way I did it is. Uh, over here, this part of the setup. So I'm checking the pixel normal workspace against the camera vector and check the dot product. So that do means sort of the angle between um, the direction the camera goes, the direction the camera is looking at and the uh, direction of the crack that's facing me. So what I want to achieve is to make the opacity of the crack go really low if um, the crack is kind of front facing me. But when the crack is facing me from this glancing angle, I want the opacity to go high. So that can reduce the amount of cracks you see at the same time, but it also makes it quite interesting to the crack you see is rather slim um, instead of giant bands of that ribbon shape. So that is hooked up like this with a little exponent to, to adjust the contrast. And, um, and that's hooked up to the opacity. So it multiplies by the global opacity and this ultimately goes to the final opacity. Um, and this is how the vertex color comes in. So the vertex color, if you remember, we have the white color for the outside faces and have the blue color for the inside faces. And the blue color has zero red value. So we're using the red channel to do the filter and use the if condition to, to check. So now you have, that's how you have different branching behavior when it's when you have red value, which is like if you have outside, you're just straight up using the opacity. When you're inside, you're using this branch with the opacity applied by this angle-based um, multiplier. The other part is uh, here. This goes to uh, base color. So this is also affected by this vertex color. And same with this one, it's the emission color, also using the masking. So you can have two different colors over there. And applied a little uh, noise texture um, to uh, go to the metallic channel. So it's kind of a little bit of a hack to get the kind of um, this sort of look on the glass to, to make it the glass reflective in a way. You actually can make it metallic. When it's a bit more metallic, um, it looks a bit more um, reflective. That's, um, I think that's the end of my section. I'll hand it back to Ben to talk about the rest of the integration.